chapter what? Seven. 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 Very good. So John is describing, again, in the best words that he can, the vision that he's receiving. Uh, you have to understand, this is around 90 AD that he's getting these visions, so some of the things he sees, he, he doesn't have TV, he doesn't go to the movies, he doesn't see things like we see things, so he has to just describe it in the best cases, best ways that he can. And so, um, he, just, he just was discussing, and, and we were reading about the, the earth was, you know, basically huge earthquake, mountains are going to be moved, islands are going to be moved, the heavens are going to roll back like a scroll, and, and he talked about that, we talked about that last week. Everybody's hiding themselves in the rocks, remember the rich men are hiding in the rocks and they're saying, please follow me, because they're afraid of the wrath that is to come of Yeshua. And they know at that point, game's up, and, and they've been trying to... <clears throat> live a life without Yeshua up to this point, thinking they've got life wickered because they're the rich people and whatever, and uh, then they know it's not true. But as we said last week, it's not just the rich. It's the mighty man and every bond man and every free man hid themselves. So it's, it's the world, right? So that's happening. So now we come to chapter 7, and we read, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Does anybody know in biblical mathematics what the number four represents? It's the earth. It, it, it has to do with the earth. And so... It used to be a phrase, I think, more common than, than lately, excuse me, the four corners of the earth. Have you guys heard that? I've heard people who are in the flat earth try to describe to me that that means it's a flat earth, and I'm like, well, your flat earth model is round, so how do you get four corners? Uh, it just means that the number, the four corners of the earth, just means the entire earth. It's like from every aspect, the whole earth is what that means. And so after these things, I saw four angels, four messengers, standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that they should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. So these winds, the wind is starting to blow. The winds are fixing to blow, and they're holding them back so that it doesn't hurt anything. And I think these winds may refer back to the four horsemen. Look in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying to me, Come and see. And I saw, and I behold, a white horse. And then we went through all that, right? There's mm -hmm. all the different horses. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, we're just going to take that, the four horsemen. The four horsemen follow a pattern from the book of Zechariah. So go to Zechariah. It's almost at the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah, what chapter are we going to? Verse 6. Now we're talking about the four angels holding back the four winds, and we're specifically talking about the four winds. Uh, and it's related to the four horsemen. Zechariah 6, 1. Let me get there. This is my new Bible. I still hear other people turning, so I'm not that late. All right, Zechariah 6, one. And I turned and I lifted up mine eyes and I looked and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot, now do you guys remember the, the colors of the horses, the four horsemen? Red, black, green, white, white, green, pale horse, green, and a white horse, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so the pale horse is, is green. The first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot, black horses, and in the third chariot, white horses, and in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. No. And I answered, and I said unto the angel that talked to me, What are these, my lord, my master? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before Yahweh on all the earth. The black horses therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth towards the south country, and the bay went forth and sought to go, that they might walk to and fro through the earth. Who also walks to and fro from the earth? Where have you been? I've been walking to and fro. Satan, right? To and fro 
from the horse, and he said, get you hence. Remember that? Get behind me, Satan, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing. Get you hence. Walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. And then cried unto me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go towards the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. So the four horsemen are tied to these four horses. And it says, uh, look, verse 5, The angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens. What do you think the word was used in Hebrew for spirits? Ruach. The Ruach. And so the Ruach can mean spirit, like Holy Spirit, right? Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Ruach is also translated wind. So now we go back to the four winds that, that we're reading about in Revelation. That it's the same colors, it's the same kinds of things that are happening. I think they're related. The, you know, four chariots, four horses, four spirits of heaven. What it is, is Yah's judgment. Yah's judgment is fixing to happen. And that's what these are going back and forth through the earth. Uh, it's bad. It's bad things that are coming from these horses, these chariots, if you will, or these winds, these ruach, that the angels are holding back. So he's holding them back for a little bit. That's what's happening right now in verse 1 of chapter 7. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Now see, he has in his hand a seal. Back in the day, everything used to be sealed. If it was official, they would melt some wax and they would press this thing into the wax like on the scroll. We talked about that. Or in some cases, like a chalk, uh, the Chinese would use it. This is the official seal. Nobody has one like it. Uh, you know it's my signature when you see it, or you know it's the king's signature when you see it. And they could dip it in ink and dip it on a, on a document, and that would be a thing. So this angel has the seal in his hand, and he's talking to, it says, he said in a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. See, judgment's coming, and these four angels are holding back the winds, but they're not going to hold back these spirits, these winds, forever. Saying, hurt not, this is what he said, the guy with the seal, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. So once the servants of Elohim are sealed in their foreheads, and again, I submit this is probably metaphorical at this point, um, I don't think that they're actually going to get a seal, but we can go there. Um, once that happens, though, those four winds are released, and bad things are coming. So at this point in time, what he is observing, there's still hope for some people. They haven't yet been sealed by the seal of Elohim, the seal of Yah, in their forehead. They haven't yet decided to follow Yeshua, but they're going to. And so it's like if we kill them now, game over for them, right? Because once you're dead, there's no do-over, right? You're standing before the Father. You're standing before Yeshua uh, on Judgment Day. And you don't get to say, oh, wait, I, I would have figured it out. And so there's still time. Hold it back until we seal these people who are going to be sealed. Let's see who they are. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed... 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Boy, that's a number that's been cast around a lot. Jehovah's Witness, right? When they first started, they said there's a, because there weren't many Jehovah's Witnesses when they started. And they're like, we're going to get up to 144,000 and then we're, that's it. We're the ones. Well, now there's well over 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and so people always wonder, who are these 144? Well, let's, let's read a little bit here. Um, 144, they are the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe... Now, see, this is part of the Bible here. When you start reading things like this, a lot of people just go, yeah, yeah, okay, 12,000 times 12. Just, let's get down to the next meet. I think today we're going to look at something that's amazing. Amazing. And we have to read this to understand it. So I'm going to keep reading. Tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher, Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim, or Nephthali, 
uh, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. That's 12 tribes. 12 times 12 is 144. It's a gross. Okay, that's easy. How do I want to approach this next bit? Let us look at these 144,000 that are sealed. They're all nominally, each, has a, each of these 12 tribes that we just read has an equal number of people. Nobody today knows what tribe they're from. That, you know, and mainline Christianity just totally misses. They swish on this one. Well, it's the Jews, and they're going to come to Yeshua in the end, and it's going to be 144,000 of them, and you know, the, this many from this tribe. So nobody knows what tribe they're in. I submit to you that Yah knows what tribe you're from, right? If you have any blood in you at all coming down. But again, you're either blood-born Israelite that goes all the way back to Jacob Israel, or you're grafted in. Either way, we're Israel, right? So if you're grafted into the tree... What tribe are you grafted into? It doesn't say. If you're grafted in, what tribe you're grafted into. So how does that work? I submit to you that these 144,000 people aren't us. They're not us. We're already sealed. We're already sealed, and I'm going to show you that. Um, the sealing is not... Not only do these 144 get sealed by Yah. It's not exclusive. That's what I'm looking for. It's not exclusive to them. Let's look in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 27. Let's look at sealing. Uh, chapter 6 of, of the book of John, chapter 27. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life. It sounds kind of like, you know, drink of this water and you'll never thirst again. Eat of this bread, you'll never hunger again, right? Similar things there. Which endures for everlasting life, which the Son of Man, Yeshua, shall give unto you, for him has God the Father sealed. So see, he's sealed. Yeshua is sealed by Yah. So he, clearly that's not exclusive, but I, I kind of got ahead of myself. We are also sealed. Go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1. Um, I can tell you where we're going. I know some of you guys are on computers. 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now, he which establishes us with you in Christ, Messiah, has anointed us, is Elohim, who has also sealed us and given the earnest spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, into our heart. We're sealed. Okay, we're not that 144,000 that they're holding back these judgmental winds, if you will, until they get sealed. We're already sealed. We have the Ruach. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We already have Christ. We're sealed. And just to kind of nail that home, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And if somebody beats me there on your computer, you can read it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. I got it. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also... After that, ye believed, and ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We're sealed. Hmm. We're good. We, we've got it. Now, you can unseal yourself, right? It's not that once saved, always saved, but we're sealed. We have the seal. So clearly, this 144,000 isn't us. Does anyone else notice, did anyone else notice a problem Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself again. So we're sealed, and I actually told you I was going to talk about this today. Almost forgot. We're sealed for two reasons. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit when we turn our lives over to Yeshua for two reasons. The first reason is for our comfort. 
We should rest in the fact that he's got us. We don't have to go through life wondering and worrying, oh no, what's going to happen if we... Yeah, forbid, because I'm not ready, but if he's ready, I guess we're going. Sister Kate and I are on our way home, and we get wiped out by a semi. Uh, don't cry for us. I know where we're going. We're, we're good. Um, there's comfort in that, knowing that, we're, that we, we're in the way, right, and things are going good. But there's also a challenge in that, that we're sealed. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh. Oh, I know. You guys want to know where. Verse 30. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of Elohim, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, we can grieve the Holy Spirit that's in us. When we willfully disobey, when we willfully act out, that grieves the Holy Spirit. So it's a challenge. We're sealed, so let's not grieve the Holy Spirit. It's the whole thing about Torah. We don't keep Torah to be saved. We're saved, and therefore we keep Torah. We're saved, we're so appreciative to our Father that he has saved us, that, you know, a wretched soul like me, that it's like, I want to make Dad happy. And so I'm going to keep the rules of the house for Dad. It's like, Alex said, hey, can you wait? i got to go pick somebody out. I said, brother, this is your house. You know, we're, we'll wait until he'd say we're ready to go. Well, we live in the Father's house, writ large. It's his rules. And so we grieve him when we don't follow those rules. Now, these 144 that are sealed out of 12 tribes. Did anybody notice anything weird about those 12 tribes? No tribe of Joseph. There is a tribe of Joseph, but there's no tribe of Dan. Mm -hmm. Now, the 12 tribes of Israel, everybody knows about that, and, and we hear about that a lot, the 12 tribes of Israel. We talk about that a lot, the 12 tribes of Israel. There are several versions of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, there's the version of the sons of Jacob Israel, right? Which I was going to go over today, but I'm not going to. Let me just tell you that Dan is one of the sons of Jacob Israel. He's one of the 12 tribes. He, you know, that is one of the tribes. And he's not in here. Dan's not in here. There's the 12 tribes, and then when Yah divides the land, the promised land to them, he gives every tribe a chunk of land Except who? Like a big chunk of land. Who doesn't he give land to? You guys remember? Levi. Yeah. Levi's the priest. And so Levi gets a couple cities scattered throughout the lands. Here's a, a Levi city. Here's a Levi city. But they don't get any land of their own. And so if, if you think about it in that way, all right, we got to stop that. That's distracting me. Come here, sweetie. You're going to go see your mommy and daddy. <laughs> okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, well, that's only 11 then. And so what happens is Joseph has two sons. Who are Joseph's sons? Manasseh and, and Ephraim. 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 Yep. And so take Joseph, you take Levi out, you take Joseph out, you replace them with Manasseh and Ephraim, because sometimes we see the 12 tribes listed in that way. Levi's not there, Joseph's not there, but Manasseh and Ephraim are there. You got 12, mm -hmm. right? You got 12 tribes. So it all works out. Spiritual or uh, governmental perfection, right? So it's good. Well, here, when we read about these, there's no Dan, but there is um, Manasseh, mm -hmm. but there's no Ephraim. But there is Joseph. See, usually when you read about Manasseh, you also read about Ephraim and Joseph's not there. But here we read about Joseph and Manasseh, but not the other son, Ephraim. It's kind of weird if you look at it that way and you consider it. And here's why. Here's why you don't see Dan and Ephraim, but you do see Joseph and Manasseh, so it makes 12. Let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 12. Dan did something bad. First Kings 12, verse 25. Then Jeroboam, the king, built Shechem in Mount Ephraim. And he dwelt therein. And he went out from thence, and he built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. 
If this people go up to do sacrifice to the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again to their Lord, their master, even unto Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Hmm, he didn't like that. Whereupon the king took counsel, and he made two calves of gold. And he said unto them, the people, Is it too much? It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. I just got goosebumps reading that. That's the word of Yah, but that is straight up blasphemy right there. Yes, you know, Yah brought the children of Israel out of the land of Mitzrayim with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And, and they worshiped the golden calf. Remember that? And all those things that came from that. And here's this guy saying, behold your gods. These brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. See, again, I got, ugh. It's like, if that happened today in those contexts, I tell you, I'd be the guy standing up yelling, blasphemer. I would be doing that. I couldn't help myself. So that's what he says. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So in Ephraim, it's, it says that, and in Dan, they set these things up. Under, and see, here's the thing. Actions have consequences. And there's this thing called personal responsibility. And Dan and Ephraim, when they allow that to go on in their land, it doesn't even matter if they're there worshiping this golden thing or not. They're allowing it to happen in their land. It's like if you allow things to happen in your house, there are certain things we do not allow on Shofar Mountain. It's like, hey, the Father gave us this land. We're not allowing these things. I bet you they're very similar things to things you don't allow in your homes. Because you're responsible for what goes on in your purview. You can't say, well, it wasn't me. They just went and did it. Well, what did you do about it? Did you cast stones at them or, or what? So that, that's a reason right there. Let's go to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4, verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. That, that's what that says. You don't have to turn there if you haven't yet. Go forward a little bit to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, verse 14. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, lives, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise again. Mm. Here's the problem with what they did. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy, the second telling. Deuteronomy 29. Where are we going to start? Verse 16. Mm -hmm. For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim, in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye pass by. And ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone and silver and gold, which were among them, lest there should be any among, among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away this day from Yahweh our Elohim to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that bears gall and wormwood, and it shall come to pass when he hears the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart saying, hmm, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. Yahweh will not spare him. But then the anger of Yahweh and his jealousy shall smoke against that man and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him and Yahweh shall blot out his name from under heaven. And Yahweh shall separate him unto the evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law. Mm. And that's one of the huge commandments. I am the Lord thy God. You shall have no other gods before me. Mm. You can't do that. One can't do that. I know I'm, I'm, I'm not talking to you directly like that. Um, but one can't do that. And yet Israel did. And see, and that's why Dan and that's why Ephraim are not in what we're reading about. And, and you can turn there now. To, to, well, actually, we're going to be back in Genesis, so hold on. Um, 
That's why they're not there, because they allowed this stuff to happen. And again, we can sit back there and look at that and go, I'd never do that. I would never do that. I'd never worship another god. And I'm telling you, people are going to. People are going to. Some people already are. Um, I think I've said it here before. I know Sister Kate and I have talked about it. A lot of people make sports a god. I mean, if you just look at how they handle it, ah, and they're all happy, and they paint themselves in their team colors, and they all go do stuff, and it's like, man, I, I had a guy tell me um, when, when they found out, they found out at my work, when I worked for the federal government, that I was a pastor. And they thought that was weird that this Green Beret with a beard this big, former Green Beret, was a pastor. Because they were all kind of afraid of me, which is kind of weird, but they were. And they come up to me and go, um, Asked me all these questions, but my boss said, so uh, how long are your sermons? And I said, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes usually. He goes, what? And I, I didn't know, you know, where he was going with the what. And he goes, man, my sermons, our sermons, you know, at his church are 15 minutes unless it's a football sermon. I said, what's a football sermon? He goes, on Sunday, the sermons, uh, when, there's a foot, when the Chiefs are playing, because this was up in Kansas, the sermon's only five minutes long because people wouldn't stay longer otherwise. Mm. Wow. That shocked me then. But that's a true thing. Um, and so people would rather, instead of hanging out and fellowshipping with the brethren, I got to go, man, my Chiefs are playing. Um, and so people do worship other gods, and it'll get worse as time goes on. Most of us name our children, and most of us are named most of us. I'm Joe. My name's Joe. My dad's name's Joe. His dad's name's Joe. His dad's name's Joe. My son's named Joe. His son's named Joe. I'm named Joe because everybody else is named Joe. And that's what Joe means. Joe means Joe. To, to my family. Right? I mean, that's why they picked it. Now, my son has taken a step, and he actually has Hebrew names for his kids, too, and they actually think about what it means, and they, and they name their children that. But my, my son's first name is Joseph. My grandson's first name is Joseph. But it has not always been so. And so we read these names like Gad and Asher and Joseph and things like that, and, and those are in our heads. And then we're going to go uh, very soon here to Genesis. You can start turning there, uh, chapter 29. And we're going to read what those names mean. But even when we read what those names mean, we don't hear it that way. It's not like we call TJ Big Tractor Driver. You know, well, that's what <laughs> Josh Josh means. It means Big Tractor Driver, but we call him Josh Josh. No, when they were saying those names, it would be like saying Big Tractor Driver. It would be like saying <laughs> Camo Guy. It would be like saying, you know, it, it would be like saying that. And so it reinforced identities with people when they use these names. The American Indians had the same thing, Running Moon, you know, Jumping Bear, or whatever. They, it wasn't just like Gush Gashmesh. It meant something. And when they said it, they knew what they were saying. We, we've kind of lost that as a culture and a society. And that's why, honestly, we all speak English. And it's a big thing in the greater Hebrew roots, Torah observant, Messianic, pick your name, to give our kids Hebraic names that mean something. Really, why don't you just name your kid that in English? Like, what's our newest granddaughter's? Tirza. Tirza, which means what? I can't even remember now, but Haya is like original woman. Or so why not just name her, you know, original, original woman. woman? I mean, right? Because that's what it really was in Hebrew. When the Hebrews heard those Hebrew words, that's what they were hearing. They weren't hearing just tears of. Um, so let's go look at what these names mean. Because if we look in Revelation at the 12 tribes that are listed, they're not listed in the order of birth. They're listed in a weird order. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? Why is that? See, that's the kind of thing that we, most people would just read right through. Okay, got them, 12 of them. Yep, got it. One, we know that Dan's not there. We know that Manasseh's there, but Ephraim's not. Now we know why that part is. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to look at something else. So let's go to Genesis chapter 29. <clears throat> We're going to look at the names. And I was thinking, but I'm not this kind of pastor. I was thinking about, as I read each name, like telling you, okay, you remember this name and what it means, and you remember this name and what it means, and, and we were going to go with that later. You're just going to have to either write it down yourself, trust me, go back and look at it later, same thing on YouTube. All right, 29, 
uh, verse 32. And Leah conceived, and she bare a son. And she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely Yahweh has looked upon my affliction. And now, therefore, my husband will love me. So Yahweh has looked upon my affliction, right? And so really, his name wasn't Reuben. It was, Yah has looked upon my affliction. Right? I mean, that, that's what they were saying. I won't keep saying that every time. All right, let's look at verse 33. And she conceived again. And she bare a son. And she said, Behold, Yahweh has heard that I was hated. He has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. 34. And she conceived again. And she bare a son. And she said, Now, this time will my husband be joined unto me. See, that's his name, joined unto me. Because I have borne him three sons, and therefore he was called Levi. So Levi is joined unto me. 35. And she conceived again, and she bare a son. And she said, Now I will praise Yahweh. Therefore she called his name Judah. And he left hearing. So Judah doesn't mean Judah. Judah means praise Yahweh. All right, let's look at verse 30. I mean, chapter 30, verse 8. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she named his son Naphtali. 11. And Leah said, A troop cometh, an army comes. And she called his name Gad. 13. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. I am called blessed. I am blessed. And she called his name Asher. 18. And Leah said, God has given me my hire, my reward. Where am I? 18. Because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Issachar. So my reward, my hire, my pay. Verse 20. And Leah said, Elohim has endued me with a good dowry, a good reward again. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulon. 24. We get to me. <clears throat> and she called his name Yosef, and said, Yahweh shall add to me another son. He is added unto me, is Joseph, added unto me. And now the baby of the family... 35, uh, chapter 35, verse 18. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. That, that's Benjamin. But his father called him Benjamin. So as she was dying. And then, because Manasseh was mentioned, let's go to... Where are we going here? Uh, I think it's 41. Chapter 41, verse 51. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for Elohim said, He has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. So all of those names mean something. And if we had made little flashcards for all those names, what their name meant, now go back to Revelation. I'm getting goosebumps and I haven't even started talking yet. Whew. This is good stuff right here. Mm -hmm. this, this is about to be cool. If we take those names and we shuffle our little flashcard deck and we put them in the order that we read them right here in Revelation, because they're in a weird order, but it's not weird. It's the perfect plan of Yah when he mm -hmm. revealed this to John. This is what it says. Reading the names in English. Praise Yahweh. He has looked on my affliction and good fortune comes. Happy and blessed am I. My wrestling has made me forget my sorrow. Elohim hears me, has, judged, has joined me, rewarded me, exalted me by adding to me the son of his right hand. Woo! That's what those names mean when you translate them into English from Genesis, when we were just reading it, and you put them in this order. Hallelujah! Wow. That's why they're there. 
Hallelujah. See, this is hope for the people. This is hope for us. And I'm telling you, we do not get into this word enough. Back in the day, the Israelites, the people that are now called Jews by so many people, when they actually read their Torah, they would get into this stuff and they would know because there wasn't one reason there was nothing else to read. I would like to say they were all totally righteous people and, and they were sinners just like we are today. But there was nothing else to take their mind away. And so they're sitting here looking at this Genesis thing and they're going like, wow, look at these names. I wonder why that means. I wonder why Rachel and Leah. And, the, and this is what they talked about. There was no People magazine. There was no Netflix. There was no football game to watch. This was what they did. And that's why we read in the Word teach your son when you're on the way and walking and doing all these things. It's just constantly keep this in, in, your, in your conversation on what you're doing. There is so much in this word. Uh, I used to watch a pastor uh, in Gravit, Arkansas, mm -hmm. Arnold Murray from the Shepherd's Chapel, and he used to say the word is pregnant with meaning. Mm -hmm. And it is, because pregnant means it continues to grow and right. grow and grow. And there is so much... I re Early in the days of survivalism, that was a question that people would ask, if you could only have one book on a desert island, what book would that be? And all the hardcore Christians, which I wasn't, used to say, well, I'd have the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, man, that's stupid. Yeah. Why don't you just have a book on edible plants or medicinal plants or, or something or first aid or how to birth a baby or something useful? I mean, those are my words. Father, forgive me. Um, but now, does anybody have a doubt if you were trapped for the rest of your life and you could only have one book, you'd have the word? I mean, it's like, no way. That's the only book I want if I can only have one. And the thing is, I have read this book several times all the way through. I've read chunks of it many, many, many times. Um, but I've read the whole book several times all the way through. And I learn something every time I read it. And today, that was one of those things that I read when you yeah. put that together. And again... Go check it out. Go write it down, make your flashcards, put them together by the tribes and read it. It's like, oh, that's amazing. So there's hope for us. So we're in a book, and, and uh, we're going to, we have in the past when we've been reading Revelation and when we go into the future, a lot of this is dark and scary stuff, right? And I submit it's coming right around the corner. We can never lose sight of the fact that we are sealed. Mm -hmm. We are sealed by him. And if you're not sealed, you need to get sealed. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and that doesn't mean that it's all going to be sweetness and light. We're all going to hold hands up there and sing kumbaya. That, that's not what it means. Hard times are coming, but man, we do win in the end. We've already got the victory because he has the victory and he has us. That's what we need to hang on to as we go. Study your word. There's a lot in it. There, there's still much more to learn. We're not going to learn. I, I submit we're not going to learn everything that's in this book before he comes. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't keep trying. Mm -hmm. There's hope for us, the saints. Let's pray.